Well, first of all, the temptation that I have is just to talk about books the whole time because I know that you and I are both big readers. And I, mean, but, I was thinking about that before we began. As a matter of fact, I was thinking, hmm, I'm going to have to talk about my new audio release. But in fact, in this lockdown thing, I've been married to my books. Me too. Like, uh, I don't know. I could have gotten through this time, this year, without reading. I mean, um, and it's, I don't know about you. I have like this deeper appreciation for literature over this last year. I'm reading different. I don't know about you. Well, for me, it's also like kind of, it's, it's kind of like mining because I'm writing a lot. I mean, that was another sort of, uh, you know, what you call it, collateral damage of the <laughs> of the pandemic for me. Good. That it, it got me writing every day in a way that I hadn't, I mean, I, I always have written every day, but I'm writing poems, which I hadn't done uh, since I was a teenager, really. And so I read the books and I steal from them. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I use the books as like, uh, my, ooh, what, what, what's opening up there? Who's Devin? Who's Devin? <laughs> That's one of our producers. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I uh, my reading has been consistent and, my, and I think about the books a lot because the thing about the books is I'm locked in this room and there's a line of the books, so I can't get away from them. Um, music, I have to kind of uh, take the initiative. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, basically because I stream now, which is me relatively too. new for me. I mean, I only really discovered that I how, that the possibilities of playing streaming through my stereo system. Yeah. Here, really. Um, but so that I have to search for. The books are are like attacking me from all angles all day. And it's, you know, I, I can't resist pulling something off and, um, and getting like a little, a little, you, you know, uh, stimulation that way. So you said that you write every day. Is that, that's always been true? Well, uh, it hasn't always been systematic. I mean, I haven't always like set, had a schedule for myself where I, I consciously chose to write every day and had a, you know, because I was working on a project or whatever. But I still would end up writing every day just because I have the impulse, you know, I'd, I'd drop something down. Good. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I'll get to forcing you to talk about what's next for you by the end. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've so enjoyed this book. I mean, this is one of the best rock and roll books I've read in so long. Um, okay. I got to talk about Destiny Street, though. I'm like burning Absolutely. up to Absolutely. talk about this. Absolutely. Like, this is, there's a lot of people that are fans of yours that watch this show. Yeah. And I told them that I was going to be talking to you, and they were all sending me questions and stuff. And there are people that watch this show that don't quite understand the timeline of this record and yeah. why, why there's a new version of it at all. Yeah. What I can tell you is <laughs> I was skeptical because I always loved Destiny Street. And when people, sometimes when people go back and they tinker with old shit, they take some of the good stuff out, you know? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think that happens very often? I mean, it's not that, I guess it's getting more common, but it's pretty rare, right? You don't, uh, you don't, there's not many examples of people going back and doing revised versions of albums they release. One, one of them that comes to mind that is so a world away from you is, is um, ELO. Um, Jeff Lynn, he like really doesn't like some of the old ELO recordings. I just it's, showed him neat. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we're getting to, you know, it's getting hot in here. Um, we he he like went back and redid all the ELO songs, and they're like I terrible. About that. When when was that? Uh, five years ago. 
Really? And it's it's like um I always thought Destiny Street sounded great, but apparently you didn't. No. Um, which I'm gonna I want you to talk about that. Like what did you not like about it and what did you feel like needed fixing? Well, uh when I recorded that, I was at my absolute um nadir of uh physical and psychological condition um i didn't care about anything um i mean i cared but um i didn't i didn't have the inner i didn't have the strength to um to act on that uh <laughs> level of caring that i had uh and it, it you know, so that, that's the personal subjective side of it was that I knew that I wasn't capable at that time of doing as well as I could. And then second of all, when I listen to it, I just hear everything is missing. I hear how um, I would, I went for a week of the three weeks that we were spent recording the thing um, to uh, <clears throat> debilitated to go into the studio. I mean, uh, I, I, I'd be doing the studio and I'd call in and say, I can't remember what, how I'd explain why I wasn't coming in. I so don't want to come to my own. <laughs> I was in such a state of um, desperation and anxiety and uh, near overdosing on, on injecting cocaine mm -hmm. um, that, uh, I knew that if I stepped out into the street, um, somebody walking by might sneeze and I would jump out of my skin and mm. I might not survive it. Uh, <laughs> I was in, uh, my, my, my um, sensitivity was so great to, um, so anyway, I would call in and say, uh, I pick out a place where I thought it might serve a purpose and recommend that a guitar solo be put here and say something about how it might be done. And so I, would, I did that for almost an entire week, um, the whole overdubbing period uh, for the guitars. Um, and the album came out uh, with six guitars on half the tracks. And it yeah. was this blare of uh, high pitched um, chaos, you know, is, that's how it sounded to me. Because, you know, I, I don't usually like that in a record. Mm -hmm. there, it has its place and there are people who like, you know, high pitched chaos. Uh, but me, I like crisp records, really. I sure. like to be able to hear every instrument. Um, I like to hear the interplay. I like, I like to hear all six strings on the guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, often guitars are played with these big blaring power chords. That, I prefer not having that. There, there has its place and there are records that do that, that I love, but um, it's not really my own personal preference. Um, I like crisp, I like crisp sounds of music. Um, I, I like it to be driving and and, sure. and full of feeling, but um, I like that clarity. And it was just entirely missing from that record. So that always disappointed me. And, you know, it was a combination of knowing that I had sort of abdicated my role as leader of the group in, in, in ways. And and also just the results when I heard it was just this wash of, of ear splitting sounds. Um, so, I, you know, my, my ideal would have been to remix it, it's, you know, within a couple of years after it came out. I mean, that probably I wouldn't have been able to pull off no matter what, because it costs a lot of money to go back in the studio and everything. But as a matter of fact, when I started inquiring about what the chances were for me to to re return to the record, it turned out they lost the um, the multi tracks, the twenty four track, two inch tapes that would have allowed me to remix the tracks. Was that true? Now I'm not trying to conspiracy, conspiracy, you know, but considering that the end of this part of the end of the story is that some of these tapes were found. Yeah. Do you think was it was was anybody at the label like trying to not have you get in? Oh, no, it wasn't that. It, but okay. it was worse. Uh, uh, the, it wasn't really a label. It was a guy named right. Marty Cow. 
uh, who uh, called his operation at that point Red Star. Um, and he brought out maybe five or six records. Uh, it wasn't a bad roster. Suicide, right. Stones, um, uh, but he was, uh, you know, uh, a archetypal uh, bottom feeding music industry uh, thug. Sure. Uh, with absolutely no sense of personal responsibility or ethics or, you know, I mean, as most people know, the music business is one of the dirtiest businesses there are. Hey, <laughs> it's still like that. You know, I really feel sorry for new bands. It's well, you know, now this everything has changed so much because record labels hardly even exist anymore. There it's is no. Now. It's like there is no music business now. Uh, it's like there is no music business. Yeah, now. there isn't really. And, and it's really it must be hard for people starting I mean, for that reason now. Like, how do you find your way to getting your music to people? Um, but when they did have power, uh, the musician in the industry was the least important person. You know, the, well, the first record, Blank Generation, was on Sire, who... Made off the 24 track tapes, too. <laughs> well, it's it was... typical. They just don't care. You know, they, they don't expect a record to ever, uh, you know, live past the, the first... 18 months of its existence. Um, and so they have no incentive in their minds to um, giving any respect to, uh, you know, the material. Um, because that's what I'm getting at. So what Marty Thau did was he didn't pay the bills. So the he couldn't get the tapes back from the studio. That's what I eventually, because that's where the, that's how I finally got the tapes returned. They were discovered in this studio story space mm -hmm. and um you know it's, com it, it, it's completely typical of, of Thou and the music industry um but um yeah so that's why the, I, I eventually discovered what had happened to the tapes he said they were lost um so do you want me to give you a quick recap of the whole thing? Is that yeah, because because that? anybody that listens to this record, purchases this record, it's it's uh it's called complete. And um the third of the three uh sequences is the new sequence. But what is this if the first one is the 1982, what's the middle sequence? Yeah. Um which, by, by the way, bringing it up, it reminds me that I made a mistake in organizing this release, which I didn't anticipate. I was just thinking of the CDs, because still, you know, that's the way I think of music. I'm mm -hmm. stuck in that from, you know, uh, coming up when I did. Uh, I think of it as a material object, but of course now it's not, it's streaming. And um, the mistake I'm talking about is when the CDs, I put them in more or less chronological order. Yeah. Demos at the end. I put the original, there's two CDs. The first one has the original and, the, and then the version I did in 2009, which I'll tell you about now. And then the, the remix, which I just did now. Um, and then that's followed by demos. But if I'd been thinking, I would have put, um, thinking of how most people are gonna first encounter the releases, which would be online and streaming platforms. I would have put remixed first. I would have, because when people see that, there's like 43, 44 songs. When people see this long list, long numbered list, and so many of the titles are so similar anyway, they're just gonna start playing it at the top. But that's not what the thing was released for. It was released for Justice Street Remix, which when you start from CD one, yeah. People will figure it out, Richard. Yeah. People will figure it out. Over and over again, because people like, when people are, you know, when you see people are sending each other copies, they send each other stuff from the original album, not yeah. from the new album. And it's not because, it's just because that's what they hear when they start playing. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> so what's the 2009 one? Yeah, the 2009 
after so I, I had to resign myself to not being able to remix it, uh, which was really disappointing to me because after all, I only had two releases in my whole career. I quit after um, Destiny Street. There was Blank Generation and Destiny Street, so it hurt, you know, um, that the second one was a big disappointment to me in that way <clears throat> because I thought the material was better than Blank Generation. Um, it was well received, I guess, critically though, Destiny Street. Yeah. Um, and I'm you were on a level of those critics, you know, because I feel like I have a end with the critics because they're predisposed to like um, uh, the 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 predisposed. Is it a New York thing? Uh, no, not not to the New York thing, but but to, um, uh, uh, sort of intellectual stuff. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know. Also, they, a lot of those know, critics are sort of semi-conceptual. They're also very literate. You know, yeah. they have a lot to do with the lyrics. Um, uh you know it would be the kind of record that a music critic would probably make if they could make a record you know? yeah but, and but I, 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 I get i get like uh so yeah they liked it um they got, got raised from a lot of you know important uh record critics i mean music critics but um it, anyway come the early 2000s I found a cassette tape of just the recordings for the 1982 record played the, the, the basic tracks played live. That's how we would record. We would go into the studio and the first thing we did was the band, the four of us, drums, bass, two guitars, all rhythm tracks, mm -hmm. no solos, no vocals. It was just the, the, the basic uh, rhythm tracks. We play that live. And that would be what we build the each track on, um, you know, each cut, each song. Um, and so I found this cassette tape that I'd made for myself in the course of the recording uh, to just to take home and, and listen to what we'd recorded uh, up until that point mm -hmm. uh, to know, to help me figure out what to do next, you know, and make decisions. So I found this cassette tape that was, you know, because as I said, a lot of what drove me crazy about the original release was it was just there's too much noise, too many players, and yeah. everything was just a, a swamp of sludge to me um, compared to what I would have liked it to be. And um, and this was clean and crisp, and uh, so and it, I couldn't help thinking when I found that this is. Um, just give me the chance to make a new version that is clean and crisp. Um, and that really did infuriate a lot of people. <laughs> uh, I mean, I got a lot of flack for that. And um, you, so you added like, was it Mark Rabot and Bill Frizzell? And Ivan Julian to play guitar. And Ivan, and I, yeah. sang everything. I made a mix of that. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it was amazing that kind of people would, really tear into me, clearly had no idea what the thing was or had not even listened to it. Um, because for, first of all, the, uh, quite uh, probably the, the predominant like attack was, uh, how could you, they would say, I erased Bob Quine from, from, that, from the mm. record. Um, Quine was dead. There was, right. <laughs> uh, I had, he couldn't have played solos on this. Uh, I didn't, he, he'd actually agreed to be the guitar player uh, on the thing when I first thought, it, thought about it and mm -hmm. talked it over with him. He said, great, yeah, uh, uh, I'm ready when you are. Um, but I didn't get around to doing it, taking up the project until he had died. So, do you mind I, me asking, Richard? Did what were his feelings about the original record? Um, I think he felt similarly to me. Uh, and, but in one way, the, th the thing he would say was, um, it was great because he got the 
opportunity to get all of his craziest ideas out of his system. Sure. <laughs> he plays backward guitars and some, you know, I mean, a, a, yeah. all weird boxes and um, solos that just are like one long note, been in and out. I don't know. You know, you just, uh, so, um, but, you know, uh, he knew that, I mean, it was, a, he, he knew that I hadn't, um, you know, I, I, I hadn't, I hadn't done what I could and should, you know, should, um, but he wasn't ashamed of it or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we both, you know, we saw it from the, our, from this inside sort of vantage that put it back. It's interesting. It, I was reading recently a Mick Jagger talking about exile on Main Street and how he can't listen to the record because it was such a dark period for the Stones and and he he feels like it could have been done so much better and then it's you funny know. you mention that because it, it was occurring to me the other day too that there were some similarities and because uh, that was recorded under really bad circumstances in a in a basement uh, where that was um like suffocatingly hot and sure everybody you know i know that uh keith richards would keep everybody waiting for 12 hours before yeah. he turn up and um and it was in nasty circumstances um and and i loved the record way that record sound i loved it from the very beginning a lot of people put it down at the time um because it was so muddy you know and uh, you called in your book. You t my favorite passage is your description of a, how much you love a racket, and you were yeah. you're referring you refer to Ex Exile Main Street. Um, maybe I could find the passage. I'll, I don't want to do that annoying thing where I read your book back to you, but you and I share that in that um, you know rock and roll shouldn't be clean and uh, and and well ordered and mannered. Um, well, it shouldn't be slick. Sure. You should hear people playing with each other. You know, you should hear people like, um, you know, like going out to the edge and coming back and, and, and saving each other and inspiring each other and, uh, and, and also just this driving energy, you know. But I, I, I do as well, like I kept saying, I do prefer I mean, and to me, like the Rolling Stones are a good example. Their their records are the best produced of any rock and roll band. Sure, for my money, um, record after record. Um, Exile Main Street was sort of an exception for its sound, and but they're such a good band that they made it work, um, and even made it like a virtue. But as a rule, you know, you, you listen to the Rolling Stones, you hear, you know, the the whole, whole, like, um, quivering, uh, physical air. Of, sure. You know, that's what sound is. It's just air vibrating. Um, I heard somebody say the Rolling, famous. the Rolling Stones yeah. are like an organism. Yeah. You know, other <laughs> right. bands are like an organization. They're like an organism, and they just know how to somehow non-verbally they just know how to become the rolling stones in a room and uh I also have and i just agree with their taste about uh what matters and what you should hear in a production you know um uh but but anyways it's funny thinking about that exile mainstream in comparison to and you know, in the context of Destiny Street, you know, I don't I sure don't put the uh, um, you know the, the achievement of of the songs and the recording on Destiny Street and the Crash of Exile on Main Street, but um, it, it did make me wonder, make me think that just in the same way that. There's all there's some so many people just say I didn't have a problem with the original Destiny Street, um, just like you, and um, it makes me wonder a little bit. Well, maybe I should get, 
cut myself a little slack and it's not as bad. <laughs> I thought to, in the same way that Exile on Main Street isn't bad. <clears throat> um, it's really good, despite the fact that it does have this, you know, um, uh, muddy uh, sort of uh, overcast feeling <laughs> to it, you know. Um, but I still do feel like, I, I actually thought the 2009 version that we that came out as Destiny Street Repair was um, was uh, better than Destiny Street as far as just a presentation of the material. Even, you know, even though we had to sacrifice Quine and Naush, and I actually thought I sang better. You know, it, it, it's a little bit, it, it's a trade-off. My voice wasn't as flexible as it was when I was young, but I, I have a, the phrasing is better. The the feeling is better. It's not just mania and sure. it has a little bit of, um, you know, it's more, the, the songs differ in how they sound according to what the material is. And I thought the singing was better. Um, the song Time is the one I noted that really benefited, I felt, from from like to the 2009 version. Um, that was such a leap forward for you, I feel like, songwriting wise. Uh, mm -hmm. Such a special song and the lyric, you know, it's, there's a world weariness in it that just seems to be tied to, you know, age. And uh, that came well, out, I think, with the later version. I wrote, wrote that. Oh, but you're talking about the performance. Yeah, the performance. Right. Right. Okay, yeah. So I felt like you brought something to it uh, yeah. in the in the redo. No, frankly, I feel like the demo that I made in like 1979 mm. um, is the best version. That's on that's on complete too. Sure, but I really, really like that other one. I mean, to me, you know, obviously, it's a minority position because, uh, but to me. A lot of what's interesting about the, the the release of Complete is comparing them and seeing, I mean, in a way, almost the story of the, you know, two CDs is as good as the music, if not better. <laughs> it's like a, um, uh, as, uh, because it, I, I don't know what to compare it to as far as a, it's, you know, but it's also partly because the the central song is time. Um, yeah. You know, and, that, and that's what the double CD is about, is time. It's like, it's like the same set of songs done three times over 40 years and also the demos of them that were done you know, a few years before that. But then another bizarre aspect to it, the, 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 you know, is, is an aspect of the story is that um, the title song is about somebody meeting themselves when they were young. Yeah. Uh, and what happens when you meet yourself when you're young? I think it's beautiful. such a beautiful, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful companion to the book. Uh, I read the book first before I listened to Complete, but it's like, it's a project where somebody who's removed from the world in which, you know, they're, they're exploring is going back to it uh, with different eyes. And um, I love that you... And that was never like the point of it for me. Okay. Like going back and changing it because I was a different person than I was when I made it. Um, it was just about the, the music. It was just, I didn't think the music did on the original, um, you know, did right by the material. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't um, like new ways of looking at it as I aged, you know. It was just about trying to make the song sound as good as possible. Um, but inevitably, it is about time, because um, time is going to have its way with you. 
and you don't have to you don't have to like uh, um, consciously um, you don't have to be conscious of it it's gonna it, you're you know just like that song says you're made out of it you know all you are is time and um, um, and and that's and you know so that those two CDs were the result for me. The thing that I felt like I noticed on the the, the song um, "Going Going Gone" when you, the the Dylan cover, you know, there's this strange relationship in the punk world with Bob Dylan that I wanted to ask you about because some people are are like super not into Dylan in punk in, in punk world. And you mentioned in your book that Quine was not really a Dylan person. Um, but you certainly were, and I certainly am. Um, of uh, course. You know, in all that period, it took me a long time to appreciate Dylan post like 1970 or something. I mean, I had, I had written him off back then. And in those days, I really, you know, in the, in the seventies, for the most part, I just thought Dylan was a has been. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't discover blood on the tracks probably until the eighties, mm -hmm. um, and that's what brought me back to Dylan. Um, uh, I just written him off, though. You know, every once in a while, I'd hear a stray song that, but, um, but yeah. Uh, once I realized uh, what a mistake it. Had, been to write him off uh yeah i mean um yeah he's yeah he's incomparable for sure yeah you can never write off bob dylan no. <laughs> people write him off every couple of years and then he always yeah. pulls a rabbit out of his hat yeah yeah um but i was just trying to think about like that song going, 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 like that, that record Planet Waves that that came off of, like how um, not punk, you know, how, how, how it was sort of like the least cool period of Dylan. I think there's some beautiful songs on it, but um, it's, it was, I feel like you rescued a song and, a, and brought it to, to a, a bunch of people that would have never listened to that record of his. Uh, similarly, you've got the Kinks cover and the Them cover. Yeah. Um, I just think it's a stacked record. And the thing I wanted to say is that, you know, I went in with a little bit of skepticism about this new version. I should not have done that because anything that Nick Zinner touches has got something good to it. <laughs> and you also worked with this very talented uh, woman, uh, who works with Tony Visconti. She did a fantastic yeah. job. What is her name? Erin Tonkin. Erin Tonkin. Yeah, I don't know. You know, Nick brought her in. He said he, she's who he'd like to work with. Um, but she was a marvel, yeah. She, she was just such a blast. And the whole experience was um, just nonstop pleasure for me. Um, uh, yeah. She was. I don't. I don't know how he came across her. I mean, the thing that she was best known for. I don't know whether it might be different in you know music world networks of that professionals or, or not. But she was the engineer for David Bowie's final record, right? Was Which is kind of a masterpiece. <laughs> I am embarrassed to say I don't really know it. I, I keep telling myself I gotta listen. I haven't yet. I haven't. I don't really know that record. Um, Black Star. But you know, Tony Biscani is a giant for sure. Um, I love T Rex. I, I, <laughs> that was <laughs> um, and back in those days before you know, just when we were first starting the band. What it was called with the Neon Boys. Me and Berlin started in like 1972, I think it was. Sure. Um, uh, that was the only existing music we liked. Was like the final, the the last uh, dying breaths of glam, like mm -hmm. uh, Slade, uh, sure. 
and T-Rex um, and the dolls. Uh, uh, I like some of that more than Tom did, but um, but yeah. So uh, yeah, it was Nick and Aaron in this little room that is Tony's studio. Um, mixing for 12 days yeah and i'm very very pleased with it i mean you know for my money it was a steady progression like and and this is the you know the apogee um as opposed to the nader of 1982 um and it, it just it, it it brings that record so much closer to what i what I think I would have done if I had if my faculties were not impaired. And uh, not sure, yeah. it's a great mix, and it's got flesh and blood. I mean, it, it, it's like uh, that racket that you talked about. That feeling of a bunch of people in a room just going somewhere together. Yeah. It has it, and um, it also brings attention to a record that not as many people as got into blank generation, not as many people knew Destiny Street. So hopefully it will just bring a lot more attention to a worthy record. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what the that's what the big satisfaction for me is. Like I only had those two records and now I feel like they've both been given their best opportunity to um, reach people, you know? I mean, the first one, it, that was just like, you know, there's a famous thing that Ezra Pound said about uh, what, um, uh, you, you, like the what's the equivalent of publishing a a book of poems, and he he compared it to dropping a rose petal into the Grand Canyon. <laughs> I mean, it's like, um, it's just like nobody cares and nobody notices. Um, though there's something beautiful about it but, <laughs> that, um, uh, because not only was the record company basically only half existed, they had no budget to do any promotion, um, any ads, any, you know, tour support or anything remotely like that. Um, you know, I mean, but um, the band didn't exist. I mean, in those days I was, you know, by 1979 and 1980, um, uh, I just, I just didn't have, I didn't care about it, any of it anymore. Mm -hmm. I would only gig to pay the rent. Um, uh, I didn't have a, a continuing band. Uh, when I had a booking agent and when I really had to make some money, I would call him up and he'd um, put together five or six days in some little circuit and I'd find uh, the best guys I could um, to join me. <laughs> We'd rehearse for two weeks and it wasn't really even a band anymore. Sure. Uh, I mean, the, that's how Destiny Street was made. I just put the band together for that album. I mean, I knew I wanted Quan to play with us for sure. And, um, uh, but he hadn't been, you know, he wasn't in every band that I went out on the road with. He didn't like right. touring either. Um, so there was no chance for that record to make it. I mean, even, uh, you know, regardless of my opinion of the quality of it and how much chance it had to appeal to people or, you know, to move people, um, it, we we weren't even able to bring it to people's attention. You know? Sure. So yeah, there was no way um, that record could have been a success. You know. Um, I'm so curious to know, like, um, when you talk about touring in those days, and you would play in New Haven and Philly, and you know, first of all, did did the Voidoids ever do like a cross country? You know, did you play Kansas City and Tulsa no. and Chicago we, and? We, we would do little, you know, we do little trips where we hit four or five places in a general area. Um, but we know we never did anything that was like more than three weeks tops. Sure. And then it would be another, you know, eight months before I'd be willing to go out again. Uh, 
and it would just be something else like that, playing little clubs. Yeah, because um, we were just off the radar. You know, we weren't because I was just in a state of. I mean, my heart wasn't in it. Right. I mean, you you hit it and quit it is the thing because, <laughs> you know, the stature of the music has just grown and grown and grown. I mean, it just, it seems like you must have known, did you feel at the time like you'd made an indelible mark as you were, as you were leaving the music business? I did not know. I, I, I mean, in a way I saw a lot of the stuff that I sort of conceived and brought to music then um, uh, be adopted by other bands and stuff that sure. became more popular than me because I wasn't even there. Uh, uh, so I knew that had happened, but it, 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 I was the only one who knew. <laughs> um, and, well, Malcolm McLaren, I, must, he knew, he must have known that yeah, he, no. he's talked about that. Um, but for Blank Generation, I have mixed feelings about that. I thought a few of the things were really well realized, and I was really happy about them. Um, but I'd go up and down. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a real self-critical person who's very doubtful about everything. I I, I kind of make a make a philosophy of it: doubt, 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 doubt. <laughs> Um, and, you know, so I, I saw a lot of uh, flaws in Black Generation, um, the album, you know, uh, but I do feel like it's strong and unique and that, and there were things it was doing that had never been done before in music and mostly in its attitudes, um, its values. Uh, um, and in the lyrical approach, yeah. I mean, it, not that your music or your words came out of a total vacuum, but it was so fresh. I mean, it was such a new thing for its time. And um, there's so much of music throughout the rock and roll era that emulates something else. But there was a unique moment there, it seems like, in New York City um where where people were trying to not emulate they were trying to rip things up yeah and also affirming the possibilities of of playing great rock and roll without any virtuosity <laughs> sure that it could be done out of pure need and uh and uh just um derive to make yourself felt you know what i mean absolutely i mean you mentioned in your book the you feel like in some ways you need to be a teenager to play rock and roll yeah um well i mean i mean my view of it is that by definition is kind of a teenage thing it's like an adolescent thing i mean it's all mixed up with raging hormones, um, all kinds, you know, just lust and, uh, but also this huge resentment at adults um, for being as dishonest as they are, you know, it's when, I mean, when you become an adult, you can see the necessity of it in a way, <laughs> like, um, that uh, every moment can't be um, like uh, 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 like a, um, an ecstatic explosion of, of <laughs> uh, meaning and, and uh, uh, but you know they kind of you have this like but adults rule the world and um and when you're a teenager you really resent that <laughs> you're not given any respect and um 
and you feel like you see more about the hypocrisy and dishonesty of the world than anybody's, you know, can stand or admit. And um, so it's a combination of those kinds of things, this like, uh, um, you know, the hormones and the anger and uh, the, the need for attention, you know, and it, you're just treated as unimportant as a kid. Um, and so in that way, yeah. And, and I can't, to, it's really like the only art form that belongs to teenagers. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's these, it's these qualities of teenagers that, that comprise, and it's this physicality, you know, um, uh, which is mixed up with the hormones too. Um, uh, so it's almost by definition teenage because there's no other art form that's about being in that condition, have being in that state, you know, uh, as being sort of its essence. Um, I mean, you can maintain that pretty long uh, if you're, you know, defiant enough. Um, mm. But Essentially, it's about that sort of condition, I think, to me, as always, it, it, that's how it seemed to me. I mean, you've had a fantastic, accomplished second act, which uh, we'll talk about in a second. But with all this distance from these records now and in that time in your life, how do you feel about the music now? Like, uh, you, you've been out of the music business for so many years. And it's not a fun place to work. I can, you know, as we've discussed, you said you're, you're, you, you, you know, very self-critical, but uh, this music still resonates with just more and more people. It seems like every year. Um, I know you're proud of it, but do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy listening to it? To my own music? Yeah. Um, well, I have this compulsion to kind of, try to orient myself in relation to it. I mean, um, I haven't listened to Blank Generation for years, but I will listen to it every once in a while. I have to be, I have to be very careful about what mood I'm in, mm -hmm. listen to it. <laughs> Cause if I'm too, if I'm in the wrong mood, I'll be, I'll be mortified. And I hate that, mm -hmm. you know, like I'll come up, I could just come away with this like completely crushed feeling like um, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's pathetic. It is like falls so short of what it should be. Um, uh, but like, for instance, on Justin Street thing now, for me, it's a weird syndrome. Like whenever uh, I'm, become aware that a given person has heard something of mine, um, it makes me curious and want to listen to it again, like as if I was that person. Yeah. I, for me, it's a funny thing about all works of art, books, music, movies. Um, they're really about the consciousness of the person who's the audience for it, a given person who's reading it, listening to it, watching it, whatever, at that moment. And what the person who created the work did, um, it's a different, it's a different um, work for every person who comes into contact with it. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's not like, it's not like a set thing. Um, the actual work takes place in a whole different space. It's, it's between the listener and the person who made it. And, but that all fluctuates too, because, um, you know, like the person who made it is also knows it could have been done a different way. Mm -hmm. Just like Justin Street has been done three different ways now. Um, the act, any given instance that you're like paying attention to is not really final. It's not like some eternal 
uh, absolute piece of work. It's sure. what happened to get done at that moment. Um, and then the same goes for the li listener. Um, they might be in a mood that day where they can't possibly tolerate this and then listen to it again six weeks later and they love it. Um, so uh, if the work has any fucking um, dimension to it at all, um, it's, it's very amorphous. Mm. You know, so for me, like what I'm getting at is like, if I, if I hear that somebody, a given person has lis listened to a record of mine, I will have this very strong impulse to listen to it again as if I was that person. Right, to hear what they're yeah. hearing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I get it. Yeah, but you're saying, okay, what, what do I think of them now? Um, yeah, it depends on what day you ask me. Well, 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. You know what they say. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I watched uh, Smithereens recently. Um, I, I thought you would laugh when I... The guy who does his preparation. I watched this film, and uh, before I knew I was going to be chatting with you... Um, it's a good film and it, and it's, you know, it's, they just did this whole deluxe thing with Criterion and this is a film that it took a while, but it seems like it grew in stature. Um, how do you feel about the film now? Uh, um, well, maybe it's a little bit like what we were talking about, like Dusty Street and Exile Mainstream shit, where uh, what felt really like, sort of clumsy and half-baked in, in ways at the time does, you know, over time you see these qualities to it that make you appreciate it more. Um, but, uh, you know, I have, I have a lot of reservations about it. I mean, it's definitely the best movie I was ever in. And I, I, I did end up being a four or five just because somebody would give me fifty dollars a day <laughs> in, those, in those years when fifty dollars um, would, you know, buy my methadone. Um, uh, but you, you know, there, there's a lot to appreciate about that movie. I, I. I really can't take myself as an actor, you know, I mean, I just, uh, I'm not cut out for that. I, I, I'm too self-conscious. I just, you know, I don't know if I could break through that, even if I studied for a long time. I actually, when I quit music, I didn't know what I was going to do um, to make a living. And I was trying to figure out what, I, I, so acting was just because people would be asking me to do these movies, even though, I was ashamed, but it would be, uh, so I thought, well, I wonder if there's a possibility of me getting somewhere with that. So I took a acting class um, and I broke my hand. Like, I don't know if you can tell, there's no knuckles here. Oh yeah. Uh, and that was during a, an acting exercise. Oh, <laughs> you were doing some Brando shit and you just, yeah. I just, a little too hard. There were, there, there, I don't know if I if, let me see if I can tell the story really short. Um, one of the exercises in this acting class um, was that uh, you, uh, get, you, you'd be partnered with somebody, it could be two of you, and you'd be doing this in front of the rest of the class. And uh, the point was, one of the people had to be doing something that took every bit of their attention. That, uh, you know, like uh, carving a toothpick, you know, carving an image of a toothpick, uh, anything you come up with. And then the other person, they're outside the room and, they're, uh, um, and they knock on the door and they, they come in and, and um, the whole point of it is that um, you, you, you're supposed to re react naturally. 
you know, you're sure. acting outside. But so the one person, the idea is these conflicting things. One person is trying to get this person's attention when the other person is trying to give all his attention to this task he's doing. Sure. So, um, I, I, when I, I was doing that, when I, I was assigned to do that, <clears throat> and um, the uh, the acting teacher decided he was going to be the one who did the exercise with me. So he comes in, I'm trying to do everything I can to focus on this thing. And he comes in and he's saying this stuff. And all of a sudden I um, feel this hand on my shoulder. Um, and I just went out of my mind. I, I leapt up and I threw him. <laughs> against the wall yes. and he got really furious <clears throat> um, and screamed at me for half an hour. In fact, he, nobody had to, he said, you're not get physical. I didn't do it on purpose. It wasn't thought about. I, 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 I it was just, I couldn't help myself. I, I was doing what he said, focusing on this thing. And then this somebody like was touching me. From, uh, um, so, he nobody had to pay for that class because he spent the whole class screaming at me. But then the next class, um, the I had to do it again with a student, and in that class, she made me so mad that I punched the wall and Ooh, I broke shit. my hand. <laughs> Damn. Um, and I I had to like go sit back down and spend the rest of the class it was too embarrassing i couldn't tell anybody how much my hand hurt and so immediately after class i go to the emergency room and get my hand fixed but i realized i wasn't cut out for acting it's still a good movie smithereens i mean <laughs> i'm sorry to tell you i hate to break the news to you it is yeah. a good film and it's got the spirit that's the thing you know it's just like you know the music we were talking about uh what it lacks in technical sophistication and <laughs> in polish it's got the spirit of that time kind you of know. you know i mean that was another thing that kind of bugged me about it uh was it kind of had a kind of mixture of hollywood slash cynical view of yeah i mean maybe there's something to if you're gonna like uh you know, um, really go into fine grained reading of cultural moments or something. Maybe there was a moment there after what was going on at CBGB's um, when um, you, but it, it, when everything was as um, just sort of about getting famous as that movie. Yes. Makes the, the, great ambition of everybody in it is to just become famous like sure um that's more like an andy warhol thing than like right a, you know um to me i felt a little bad about being in a movie with that treated downtown new york as a bunch of people wanting to become famous because mm. that's not you know i mean sure everybody at cbgb's wanted to take over the world for sure, but it had to be on our own terms. Right. You know, um, whereas in that movie, it was just about somebody doing whatever it took to get famous. Sure. Uh, so Richard, you've been very generous with your time. You know, I didn't hear a safe word. So we rolled through almost an hour. Listen, this book is a beautiful book. Um, I, I just, uh, it's amazing to me that it took you a minute to figure out that you were a natural born writer and that that was going to be your second act. Um, you said that you're writing every day. Are you able to talk about any upcoming projects or anything you're working on? Well, you know, I, as I mentioned before, I found myself as soon as the lockdown started, it was really weird. It kind of put me back to when I was a teenager in a certain way when you know, like when you're a teenager, like when I first came to New York and I was 17, drop out of high school, it's like this funny mixture of the days are so long. You just don't know. Uh, 
there's nothing to do. Uh, like, uh, there's so much just, uh, okay, what are we going to do now? Um, um, but a lot ends up getting done somehow or other. Um, but then as you get older and you get some kind of track record and you start, you know, doors open and whatever, there's always a billion things to do. Um, and you never have any like downtime. Um, and to have nothing but downtime uh, from, from getting from lockdown, mm -hmm. it put me back into this thing where I wanted to write poems and I started writing poems and I've accumulated basically a manuscript, book manuscript. And Great. Um, it, it's really funny because I, I really feel like I've always, I've, I've, I've always had corrected people when they call me a poet. I don't like it, you know, um, because I left poetry when I was 21 um, to start playing music. And, and I hadn't really even arrived as a poet. I was just barely figuring out how to accomplish anything writing poems. And um, so, you know, it was from like age 16 to age 21. Uh, and without being, without ever really fully, you know, uh, uh, forming. Um, sure. So, I, you know, I never talked about it at all when I went into music because I, the last thing I wanted was to be called a poet as a musician. Mm. But then, um, you know, within eight or 10 years, it got to be a thing, you know, because Patty, made a point of being a poet. And mm -hmm. um, people would pick up on these little clues there were. And so they started classifying me and even Verlaine, who never really published anything to speak of, except a couple of things of his that I published. Um, uh, so I'm being called poets. So anyway, what I'm beginning is, so, but I love poetry and I, and I, it, I would love nothing better than to, to qualify as a poet. Um, and now I feel like at this advanced age, I've been able to have a year where that was true. Um, so it really, that really makes me happy. It really makes me feel good because I, you know, it wasn't that it wasn't it wasn't that um, I was experimenting. It was. I knew what I was doing and it yeah. was natural. And I, I just took my, I just focused my impulses to do things into making poems. And uh, uh, yeah, I feel really great about it. Before you go, Richard, and I can't, I can't wait to hopefully see a release of these poems at some point. Um, yeah, we just sent it to my agent this last week. It'll come out, they'll come out in some form in the next, you know, 18 months. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Um, before I let you go, you know, uh, your work um, has meant a lot to a lot of people, including myself. Uh, so I want to thank you for your great work uh, then and now. Uh, I look forward to whatever you do. Uh, I wish you nothing but health, success, fulfillment, whatever you want. Hope you get it. And uh, I just thank you so much for spending this time with Tough Cookies. We have a lot of people watching this show that are fans of yours. And uh, it's been great chatting with you, my pal. Yeah, back at you, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure.